Okay, welcome everyone to another session of the History Trust's Talking History Lecture Series. My name is Tony Canellos, and I'm the Audience and Experience Project Manager at the History Trust of SA. Martin Naputni, Gana Yartaana, Gablu Tampinti, Gablu Gabna, Yatanga Imparenti. It's good that you all come to Ghana country. We acknowledge we meet on Ghana land, which is where I'm located today. The History Trust also acknowledges the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. And since we are online, it's appropriate for us to consider the First Nations peoples of the place from where you are streaming uh, this session. It's my pleasure to be hosting today's session, which won't be a lecture, but rather it takes a more intimate format of a conversation. We'll hear Jennifer Coburn talk about her book, Writing for His Life, Stuart Coburn, Crusading Journalist. And she'll be talking with former ABC journalist, Simon Royal. While we were hoping to do this live and in person, that was not to be a story we've heard many times in the last couple of years. So we have pre-recorded the interview. However, Jennifer and Simon are here in Zoom land with us now and will be available to answer your questions. During the conversation, please use the chat function to tell us where you're from and use the Q&A function throughout the session to ask your questions. If you see a question you like, use the thumbs up and uh, we'll be asking the most popular questions first. This conversation will go on for about an hour and then we'll get to the questions. So get into a comfy chair and we'll get started. Jennifer Coburn has, a, has had a long distinguished career as an international lawyer. After leaving the profession, she took on a project, one that was very close to her heart, writing a biography of her late father, the Australian journalist and author, Stuart Coburn. While born in Canberra and growing up in Canberra and Adelaide, Jennifer has worked and lived in the US for a long time and is coming to us via Washington. And what better way to explore this story of one Australian journalist than have a conversation with the author, and another journalist, our very own Simon Royal, whose work we've seen on television, heard on the radio and read in the paper. It's my great pleasure to introduce Jennifer Coburn and Simon Royal. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, Tony. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening and good morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A very early good morning. <laughs> Tell us what time it is there. Uh, it's just after five in the morning. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we, we're going to we're going to play this um, this conversation that, that we recorded earlier, and um, people will get a chance to um, comment and ask uh, post questions for later, and then at the end we'll come back, say hello to you again, and answer some questions. So sit back. Um, enjoy yourself and see you in an hour. Jennifer Coburn in Washington, welcome to Adelaide for Talking History. Thank you, Simon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you or at least here in Washington talking to you in Adelaide. Well, it's, it's great to have you with us. I want to start with a little summary of Stuart. It's actually a long little summary because there's a heck of a lot to, to summarise. But Sam Jacobs, a Supreme Court judge who was Stuart's friend from the earliest days, described him as a curious mix. On the last day in his obituary, his colleague Don Riddell described Stuart as possessing the vast Coburn conscience and the tiny Coburn tolerance that combined to send editors into despair. A man of contradictions. Handpicked by Keith Murdoch for greater things and intensely loyal to the advertiser, he'd leave it four times and find himself at points agreeing with the description of the paper as a dowdy 19th century provincial organ. He voted Labor but worked for Menzies and admired Menzies. He wasn't chummy with Menzies. He annoyed Menzies. He annoyed Tom Playford. He really, really annoyed Don Dunstan and the feeling was deliciously and fulsomely mutual. He despised injustice. His crowning triumph was he was instrumental, fundamental, in overturning one of the most egregious cases of injustice, the murder conviction of Edward Splatt. But a few years earlier, 
He'd sided with the police commissioner who kept secret files on ordinary citizens and misled the government in the process while doing it. And we'll use the word egregious again, an egregious destruction of democratic norms. A vastly prolific writer, inveterate. He wrote news, he made news, he wrote opinion. He led opinion, he fell behind it at times. He wrote marvellous features and profiles, which were his great love. His round robin family letters provide some great insights. And in one case, uh, the only record we have of an important piece of Australian history. And on a personal level, I feel this is a most underrated art form. His dog rule was to die for. <laughs> <laughs> and yet he'd describe himself only as a good, clear writer, but not as an elegant one, as Shirley stopped to spoil. He was an insider who felt like an outsider. He disliked sport. He didn't smoke. He didn't go to war. He flirted with pacifism. He wanted to go to war. He couldn't because of his TB. He didn't go to university because of family circumstances. He was a man of contradictions. And I've been thinking, where in the hell do I begin? But then I thought 10 years ago, where in the hell did you begin? <laughs> Jennifer <laughs> Coburn, <laughs> how did you begin writing this story? Well, uh, first time, and that, that was an excellent um, overview. Um, thank you for that. Um, and, and this story begins sometime in the late 90s. I don't remember exactly why or how it came to my mind, uh, but it did, um, that it would be interesting to write a biography of my father. Um, at the time, I was uh, practicing law in, in Washington, where I still live, um, an international lawyer with a, a, a part of the World Bank group. Um, so this was totally out of left field in a way. Uh, I mentioned it to my father and he said, oh, Jenny, I'm not worth a biography. Uh, you know, Max Fatch and Colin Tealy, those are the great South Australian writers. But why don't you write a family history? That would be a good thing. Um, and so... He did agree ultimately to sit down with me for about uh, several weeks in 2005 uh, and showed me his files and I recorded um, conversations with him. Uh, he still thought that a family history was the thing to do. Um, but I, I felt differently. Um, and the as I talked to him, as I started to sample his files, as I had uh, conversations with his former editor, John Scales and old friends, um, it came to my mind that he fitted um, the description he gave us to Mark Oliphant, whose biography he co-authored uh, in 1991, um, 1981, sorry, where he said, um, that Sir Mark Oliphant was brimming over with character. And I thought, well, I think my father is brimming over with character. He's a great subject. And, and, and you alluded to this issue of contradictions. He was a fascinating personality, intense um, and passionate, um, a, um, a sort of uh, a natural journalist, um, curious, uh, there are just so many adjectives you could use to describe my father. So that was one thing. And then the other thing was he really did have a very interesting career. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he uh, started out in Adelaide, but he um, spent time in the press gallery in Canberra as a young journalist. He went to Melbourne to work for the um, Melbourne Herald where Sir Keith Murdoch noticed him and uh, got him a job in London right after the war. He spent time there with Reuters and then the Melbourne Herald Cable Office. Uh, came back to Australia and he was um, approached by Sir Robert Menzies to be his press secretary. And so off he went to Canberra uh, for three years and then uh, because of health issues with um, a dormant TB scar, um, he had to resign and return to Adelaide. And then he uh, became a um, very well-known, uh, prominent uh, journalist in Adelaide, 
a feature writer with the advertiser. He did radio work. He even did a little bit of TV. Um, he went off again to Washington as press attaché for the Australian Embassy in the early 60s. Um, you and with then him? Came back. Oh, sorry? And took you with him? And took the whole family, mm -hmm. um, my mother and uh, my three siblings, and came returned to Adelaide. He had one more um, period out of Adelaide in Canberra, and then he spent the last... Uh, 10, 12 years of his career in Adelaide where he, um, I think, really uh, saw his greatest successes in a way. Um, so there were those two things, but the, the clincher for me was his, his trove of writings, his letters and his diaries. And they just, they just spoke to me. They, just, they brought him to life. They brought the world around him to life. Um, and there was so much of it. He was a prolific letter writer from a young age, and he had kept all this. Um, he wrote significant journals um, in while he lived in England after the war. Uh, he wrote round robin letters from America in the early sixties. So there was just so much material. You, I, I couldn't ignore it. <laughs> well, and that's what I. This is one of the things that I thought would be good to start with was, was where did you start? Because, and let's try and get a sense of the dimension of it um, because it can be daunting. H how many articles did he write over his lifetime? Do you know? Uh, how many letters are there? And you mentioned radio and I was thinking about this. Well, that's ephemeral. Is there any radio copy there uh, that you that you have? Please, please give us a notion of the dimensions of the task that you set out for uh, that trove as a biographer, which was a wonderful thing to have, but also I expect extremely daunting. Right. Um, you know, I, I've always sort of said to myself, I must come up with some numbers here, and I found it very hard to do. Um, and I, you know, I mean, there are just hundreds, probably thousands of, of articles. There are... Um, the the letters the same thing um because he kept so many of them uh you know and what one of the first problems for me was that i was living in washington and even though i i only started this after i retired in 2008 um i did not plan to move back to australia um i did take several trips to do some research but i was primarily doing my work here in my study in, in Washington. So one of the, the first things um, that we did with the help of my stepmother, Jennifer Cashmore, was to hire somebody who um, scanned the bulk of my father's papers um, and put it on a disc and sent it to me. And so I had all the material on disc. I also had material from the Barsmith Library at the Adelaide University um, because my father had donated his scrapbooks to um, the Barsmith Library several years earlier, and they had um, put those on a CD-ROM. So I had, for instance, his scrapbook on the Splat case um, with all of the articles, um, and uh, it, was, it was mainly the articles um, about the case, um, not just by him, but um, by my, by many different journalists and different newspapers. So I had all of that material. And then over time, I just started um, printing out uh, the material and putting it in files. As far as where I started, um, there, there were a couple of things. Um, one was that I was not aware of the diaries that he kept uh, when he was in England in uh, the late 40s. Uh, and also he he um, had a journal that he wrote on his months long voyage to England in, in 1947. So this was fascinating for me. Um, I knew he'd been there, but I, I certainly had never read the day to day details. So that was one of the first things that I looked at and I, I printed out, transcribed his diaries. Uh, my daughter actually helped to transcribe some of them. And um, I remember some advice I was given because I was thinking this is such a waste of time typing all this up and the advice is no because as you type this material up 
you absorb it, yes. you know, uh, and that certainly happened with me. Um, so I started with that, and the first couple of chapters I wrote, uh, one was um, uh, based on those diaries, and the other one was based on the round robin letters that he sent from America in the mm -hmm. early 60s. Um, and at that point, I had thought, well, maybe a full blown biography is a bit much. Maybe what I should do is an edited selection of his letters and diaries. And so that was how I wrote those first few chapters. Um, and I think I had four and five chapters donated to these uh, to, uh, that were dedicated to these diaries. I mean, in the end, I reduced that quite a bit. But um, I eventually changed my idea at, and thought, no, I'll do a, a proper biography. But I think that the way I approached the biography um, is very much a product of that early idea. So that there are chapters that really are based on certain correspondence or certain journals um, that I thought were, um, uh, you know, very important in bringing uh, to life my father and some particular aspect of his life. Um, so you will find a number of chapters that really are structured based on yes. correspondence. Yes, he, he provided the structure in a way. Seems to me that at one point in time, you'd have asked yourself a simple question, and that is, should daughters write biographies of their father? And yeah. what I mean by that is, is that the past does not play by our rules, and that in writing about him, you make both him vulnerable and you make yourself vulnerable as well, because, for example, you, you've written the, the points in time where there were things that he wrote about with the best of intentions about race and assimilation, which are cringeworthy today. He used, he spoke about women in a sense that, um, you know, he described Jackie Kennedy as luscious. <laughs> um, <laughs> not the first to do that. No, he was not the first. <laughs> he thought the Queen was pretty good too. But look. Yeah, yeah. The point of this is, is that um, we don't live in times which uh, suffer well intentions well. Um, you made him vulnerable, uh, mm. perhaps. Tell me about that. Well, um, this was something I struggled with. And, yes, it, it, a lot of people would say that um, a, a, a daughter or son is not an appropriate person to write a biography of somebody. And... Um, I think I, I felt, even though, and I'll talk about it, there, there were difficulties in, in, in being a daughter and writing about him, uh, I felt right from the start that I had to be objective and that um, I, I had to achieve a, a, a balance. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt I was reasonably well positioned to do that. I didn't have a grudge against him or about my childhood but I also didn't think he was the you know the greatest thing since sliced bread um I I knew his um a, a lot about his strengths as a person and a journalist and I and I I knew what his flaws were so in that sense I knew him very well um but I'd also lived outside of Australia most of my adult life and although I knew what was going on, because he would always send me his articles and um, would write long letters, and so I knew very much what was going on in his life, um, I had that distance. And I think that that probably helped me when I came to write his biography. Um, and in terms of this vulnerability, um, when I started reading some of these things that you you refer to that that made me cringe, there was a personal element in my cringing because, you know, I wanted my father to be, you know, this wonderful role model. I wanted him to be progressive and visionary. And there were things that I realized, no, he was he was a little bit behind on some of these things. Well, maybe um, he was a creature of his time. As we he was a creature of his time. He was very much a creature of his time. And so one, the thing that really made me feel much more comfortable going forward was that I, um, I was very lucky in, in to living in Washington um, to um, 
be a member of a bio, Washington biographers group. And then subsequently, one of um, the people who'd helped found that founded a um, biographers um, organization here. And I went to many of the conferences. And at one conference, the biographer of Bobby Kennedy spoke. And, you know, we, we think of Bobby Kennedy as this wonderful, progressive, brilliant person who would have made a brilliant president if he hadn't been assassinated. And the biographer was talking about the fact, and I didn't know this at the time, that Bobby Kennedy had uh, worked for Joe McCarthy, that he'd been and, close to Roy Cohen. And Roy Cohen. Cohen. And Roy Cohen, yes. who were both Ghastly pretty people. people. Yes. And the bi and uh, the biographer, I'm sorry, his name slips on my mind right now, but he, he said, look, um, people... Um, you know, we're, we're all human. People have their faults. They have their flaws. They have periods in their life um, where, uh, you know, their actions are deplorable, but then they go on to do wonderful things. That's just the nature of being human and that you have to accept that. And that really helped me uh, in, in dealing with some of the things about my father that I, you know, felt uncomfortable about. We'll come to the point that you've made about fairness and so on, and, and you don't spare him uh, some judgment at times. But I want to talk about the vulnerability for you for a moment. Doing this biography meant that you had to write about your mother, Beatrice, and, and her uh, early and untimely death. Now, here, here come all the caveats with this question. I do want to go back and read this section again. But on uh, first blush, uh, my impression is, and shoot me down if I'm wrong, is that there's um, some restraint there that's not there in, in other places. I thought to myself, good on her. She's kept some stuff back for herself. Um, is that a reasonable assumption? Um, and how do you write about the death of your mother? Mm -hmm. Well... I mean, I guess, again, I'm, I was writing about, this is a biography of my father, mm. and I don't think I really spared anything in portraying his grief. Um, and I assume that you're really talking about my grief. Yes, I am. Uh, and I, I, I suppose I talked about it collectively in terms of mm. myself and my siblings. Um, That's what I meant about holding something back. It seems to me yeah. that your father understood yeah. that the essence of covering tragedy is that um, you need to respect the victims. Now, editors and the audience might want tears, but mm -hmm. your soul, your own self-respect and, and that, that of the person whose story you're telling require mm -hmm. you not to, to go there. And I just wondered if that was yeah. something. That well, I think, I think I looked at it more as... I do, I, I do need to portray my father's reaction and the depth of his grief and the way he reacted. And I don't really, I didn't really hold back there. And I think, uh, you know, to the extent of saying that he blamed himself, you know, that he'd caused all this stress in her life and that's why she got cancer. Well, who can say that? But, um, and I, and I felt comfortable not holding back there because he was such an open book himself throughout his life. Um, and he did. He wore his heart on his sleeve. He he wrote intensely personal letters, um, uh, and so I felt that he he would not uh, he would find it quite acceptable that I would write very personal things about him in that context. Mm, but not necessarily you, right? You by extension, I suppose is the. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, to some of the uh, the judgments on him and what he might have made of the book. Now, you describe his reactions. This is to do with when uh, the biography of Sir Mark Oliphant came out in, in 1981. Um, he published a letter which didn't reflect well on, on Oliphant. And, you just, and there was a reaction against that, quite an intense backlash. You describe his reaction to that reaction as uh, self-righteous. And I think you may have even used uh, sanctimonious <laughs> as well. <laughs> Um, what would he have made of that? Um, I think that he would probably agree with my assessment. Mm. Uh, I think uh, 
and it was it was revealing because it showed that even at that late stage of his life, he found it very difficult to um, control his emotions and not be impetuous. Um, and it it showed a certain thin skin, which I think he acknowledged mm. later. And he wrote that he had become at that point uh, too um, sort of somewhat vain about his reputation. Mm. Um, I don't think I referred to that in the book, but I but I think he felt that um, he was too concerned about protecting his reputation. Um, and so I don't, I, I think he would probably agree with that assessment. Hmm. Um, I think he had valid, there were elements of validity in his reaction. He was upset that his newspaper had, had, um, published the story about this letter, um, in which Oliphant had advised Dunstan that the choice of, uh Pastor Doug Nichols to be governor was was um inadvisable. Because of um, the because of Aboriginal advancement. Right. Hmm. Um so he um I think he 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 was fair he was fairly upset that the paper had jumped the gun and written this article ahead of the um uh what do you call it when you uh, you know, there wasn't to be any comment on the book. Embargo. It was embargo. embargo. Right. So, so that was reasonable. And I think it was, uh, he was also reacting to comments that um, the AJA officials in South Australia made about a comment he made about journalism being sensational. And in that sense, they were being holier than thou. Mm. Oh, Fancy calling journalism sensational. <laughs> so, you know, there was a little bit of that on each side. Yes. Um, but yes. instead of just saying, fine, you can say whatever you want to say, yeah. it, it was his personality to want to come back and argue, yes. which he did. <laughs> um, the thin skin's an interesting term because it was perhaps something that he shared with, and we'll deal with this later, with somebody who, whom he had a really tempestuous relationship with, one thin-skinned mm -hmm. Don Dunster, but we'll talk right. about that in a second. But So sanctimonious or self-righteous, but early on in the biography, you have a letter that he wrote to his father where he talks about his um, uh, constipation and then also <laughs> his poor spelling, which later on in life, your father would become a despot over poor spelling. So I can see, hear him now in that mellifluous voice of his, Jennifer, you've just told my critics and enemies that I am uh, self-righteous and full of you-know-what. <laughs> Did you really <laughs> have to do that? <laughs> I suppose what I'm asking you is would he have liked the book? <laughs> I think so. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I... Um, and I think the reaction of my, my stepmother, Jennifer Cashmore, to the book, I think... Um, reflects that. Um, I think she's, she really liked and enjoyed it. And she, mm. of course, had seen a lot of the drafts. <clears throat> um, but I think that she thought I portrayed him in a pretty accurate and, and fair light. Would he have found, approached his flaws with, and your revelation of them, thanks very much, <laughs> with good humour and good uh, grace? Well, yes, because he talked about his flaws a lot. Mm. <laughs> yes. Um, he did. I mean, he, he acknowledged that he was impetuous and restless and uh, could be obsessed and, um, you know, he knew, he knew himself pretty well. So in, in finishing this part of the, the conversation, the, the nuts and bolts of writing it, should daughters write biographies of their fathers? I think it depends on the circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, daughters I can always write reaction. memoirs. This is not a memoir. Hmm. But um, but there's certainly there are certainly people who do it, including a writing um, friend of mine here in Washington. We had a writing group and... She's uh, finishing up a biography of her father, who was a prominent diplomat. And again, I think she's done an excellent job. 
So it's possible. We're talking history with Jennifer Coburn and her book on her father, Stuart Coburn, writing for his life, a crusading journalist. Why did, um, and you're in Washington, of course, we're here in Adelaide, we should point that out. Why did Stuart go into journalism? Um, I think it was, I think it, fundamentally it was because it was in his DNA and that his father, was a prominent journalist in Adelaide, um, greatly admired. His grandfather had been a compositor on the register, which was eventually became the advertiser. Um, he, so I, I think it was just, it was a given. On the other hand, he did, I think, um, feel regret when he saw his friends going off to university and uh, his mother, who was a, a widow then, could not afford to send him to university. And he, um, I think he felt that he was missing out on something. Uh, but on the other hand, once he started as a copy boy and then became a cadet journalist, he just loved it. He was just a natural. This was what he was put on earth to, to do. Yet he so. also questioned it at times quite early on in his, his 20s, I think it was, that he... he said he felt, and it was a poisonous thought is how he described it, a man cannot be successful in modern journalism and save his soul. He had these periods, you know, he yeah. found the advertiser on point in time ploying. Um, he mm -hmm. had these periods of, uh, was it him or was it the profession? I guess I'm asking. Um. Well, I think it was a it was a mix. Um, I mean, I think he was by nature a, a very serious and introspective person. Um, he had very high uh, standards, strong morals, you know, a strong sense of right and wrong. And um, so he could he could look at 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 the newspaper world, a commercial newspaper world, and and the the fact that. You know, basically, they had they made their money um, primarily through advertisements and so on, and that newspaper owners has tended to be quite ruthless, and that was a part of his world. So I think he um, he just he grappled with that, but on the other hand, the day to day life of a journalist. Um, uh, observing the world, interpreting it for readers, um, interacting with people, learning new things. Mm -hmm. He just, he loved all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so even when he had his doubts um, and, you know, later in his career, career at one point, there were very serious doubts and he left journalism for several years. But um, he was able to resolve that because I, uh, it, he accepted the reality of the newspaper business, but he also accepted that this this was what he loved to do, and he he couldn't he couldn't escape it. I mean, every time he got offered a public uh, relations job, he would think about it and agonize it, but but he always ended ended up rejecting those jobs. Well, I mean, yeah, it was one with SA Brewing, and there were an astonishing array of them. One with SA Brewing, one at Flinders University. Right, um, right. How did he feel about the relationship between power and journalism? Gosh. Um, well, you know, I think uh, from his point of view, even, even though someone like Sir Keith Murdoch was a mentor, um, and Murdoch had a, a very um, uh, interesting view, one might say, of, of how to use his power as a, a, a newspaper executive um, and his ability to influence governments and so on. Um, my father took more the... Um, the words of Murdoch about journalists having a strong sense of public purpose and Mission. that they were there to, you know, seek out the truth, 
um, seek out the facts. That was what really influenced my father. And, you know, I think, you know, one interesting thing is he never aspired to, to be a newspaper executive. He never was interested in being in management and he wouldn't have been good at it. Uh, but that was just not something he wanted to do. Uh, and so I would think, I think in terms of power, uh, you, you may say later on, um, for instance, in the context of the Salisbury affair, that he, he did enjoy that power that he had to influence public opinion. Um, but I would say that generally he was there to, to inform people and uncover stories and do justice. Those were the things that really propelled him. And of course, uh, that involved power as a journalist to be able to do that, to be able, you know, to be able to investigate something and then write a story in an in a newspaper that the public would read and maybe it would influence the government and so on, for sure. He got an early taste of the relationship between the advertiser, or relatively early, but of the relationship between the advertiser and Tom Playford over a series of articles truncated by, by Tom Playford uh, about problems at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Now, he did not feel comfortable with the advertiser's relationship uh, towards Playford, did he? No, and and more than Playford, the the Adelaide establishment. Mm. Um, I think he felt that, and, and you know, it's partly the fact that Adelaide was in South Australia. Um, you know, were not big places, so you know, people on the board of the advertiser were also on the board of local companies or um, Adelaide, the Adelaide Festival of Arts, which, which was something that was. Uh, founded by, I think, Sir Lloyd Dumas, who we had mm. came up with the idea and so on. There were all these interrelationships or, you know, people on the board who were a member of the Adelaide Club. Um, and he did feel very constrained that there were limitations on what you could write and how you could write it. Kid gloves was the term that he used. It, it once said to a memo to management. Um, his, his views were well known. You know, we oh, have yes. hit gloves and criticisms of the Liberal Party. Right. And and he talked about the sacred cows. Yes. yes. You know, well, we can't write about uh, one-way traffic on Rundle Street because mm. that would upset certain business interests who advertise in our paper. Uh, and he, you know, he, he never shrank from writing outraged memos to his, uh, his editors <laughs> and, and so on throughout his career. Yes. <laughs> I just, for a moment, I sort of want to slide, sidetrack slightly. And I've been thinking about this um, as we looked at this section uh, of his, his career, this relationship between power and journalism and so on. And I wondered how he'd feel about News Corp as it is today. And, and by that, I mean, Playford was a thoroughly decent man. Um, Donald Trump is anything but a thoroughly decent man. But in terms of the institutional support that the advertiser was offering Playford in, in 1950, and say what Fox News does now in 2022, is there any difference apart from, from the worthiness of the objects of the support, um, mm. which doesn't reflect well upon the institutions necessarily? Mm. What would his attitude to that, to that current, this current relationship be? And would he say, actually, it is different to my time and what I objected to? Um, I think he would he would acknowledge the similarities. Uh, and he was he was critical um, of the stance that the advertiser took as the sort of in you know liberal newspaper, uh, Liberal Party newspaper, and it's um, sort of unwavering support of the Playford government over the years. Uh, he he was critical of that. And later he he acknowledged, I can't remember where he wrote it, but he acknowledged that uh, Dunstan did not get a fair go early in his career, that the, the advertiser ignored him. Uh, and, you know, the news wrote about him. Um, but uh, he, he got... Um, you know, short shrift um, with the advertiser. So he would acknowledge that um, and that it needed to change, which I, which I think it did, uh, mm -hmm. certainly in the 70s. Um, but um, I think the difference, uh, 
and I and I, I would argue this is that um, in at least certainly in, in later, perhaps not at the exactly at the time of Playford, but for instance during the Salisbury affair, my father's view was just one view in a newspaper that published views of other journalists and uh, citizens who disagreed with him, including... Well, well, the advertiser when he came back in 1971 was quite, for the last time, was quite... Right, right. Wasn't it? Right. And, yes. And so I would say the thing about the, the Fox network is it's not a just that they support Trump, whatever he says or does, but there are so many untruths that they... Um, spread. I mean, just outright lies knowingly over and over again. And I, I don't think you could say that the advertiser did that. No. Well, it's certainly not to the same extent, <laughs> even, if, even if they did hold back those two articles on the Royal Adelaide Hospital, yeah. but the there, message had already got out. <laughs> there, there's a, a difference fundamentally, I suppose, between supporting a decent man and supporting one who's um, not. Hmm. Why did your father keep coming back to Adelaide? What does that say about him? Mm. Well, I think this was one of the things I found interesting in in researching his life. Uh, as I said, I mean, he was an open book, so there weren't a lot of big surprises for me um, with his life. But I think one thing that was was this um, conflict he felt uh, from his early years as a journalist when he moved to Melbourne um, in 1945 after the, the war. Um, and that continued over the course of his life. Um, this conflict between being very ambitious and really wanting to have a, a good career as a journalist and be a good journalist and um, see the world and make an impact. But he also had this extraordinary um, attachment to Adelaide and to his friends there. Uh, and I don't know whether that was partly because he was an only child and he lost his father when he was 10, 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, but so friends were very important to him. Um, some of the large families that he uh, was very close to in Adelaide were important. The Heisons were, were incredible. The Heisen incredible. family was very important. He went to school with Stefan Heisen, who was one of Sir Hans Heisen's children, um, and those times were very precious to him. Um, and so he 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 found it very difficult to stay away for long. Uh, he did stay away for nearly 10 years, uh, from 1945 until 1954. Um, but uh, he really did have um, a fondness for, the, for Adelaide. Mm. We will get to the elephant or elephants because I think there are three of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dunstan. <laughs> well, Dunstan, Salisbury and Stuart Coburn. <laughs> and I'll explain my reason for that in a moment. But okay. I just wondered whether, did he have regrets about coming back or were what were your father's regrets? Hmm. Well, his biggest regret was that he uh, played a big role in um, a journalist strike um, at the Advertiser in 1967. And as a result, although I don't think that was the, the, the main or certainly not the sole cause, um, because he, he was becoming, I think he was having a little bit of a midlife crisis and was very uh, depressed about the future of journalism. Uh, and he decided that he had um, um, disappointed uh, the advertiser management who had treated him very well. And uh, he got an offer of a position in Canberra outside of journalism, and he decided to take it. Uh, and he, so he will always say that that is his biggest regret. Uh, that he went to Canberra, his partnership with another ex-journalist in a, a sort of a news agency that mm. provided information to um, corporate and business clients on what was going on in Parliament. 
it was a disaster. The two of them. Uh, he he hated the on. work, and the pair of them didn't get on. He hated the work. Um, he he missed the writings. The work was repetitive, um, and so in we stayed. The whole family stayed in at Canberra three years, and then he returned to Adelaide. Uh, and he will say that was the biggest mistake, uh, that his biggest regret. Um, and interestingly, what he didn't talk about, and which was the other thing that I discovered, at, at that time, before he made the decision to, to go to this agency in Canberra, he had also had an offer from the editor of the Canberra Times, um, David mm -hmm. Bowman, um, who was a highly respected journalist, um, who had um, struck up a, a wonderful sort of uh, correspondence with my father, uh, who was the South Australian correspondent for the Canberra Times. And Bowman offered him a sort of a, a job where he, my father would write leaders, advise on policy, do a bit of writing. Um, but my father was so um, depressed about journalism at that time and also I think just had this real self-doubt, you know, about, well, what, could I really do this? Um, and um, would I would I rise to the occasion in this job? And he turned it down and went with the other one in Canberra. He never talked about that, and I thought that was very interesting. And he loved Canberra too. I mean, Adelaide and Canberra were yes. his. Yes. It is, it is a, a strange one. He was not a big city person. Hmm. He loved nature. He loved um, being in a in a smaller city or town that was close to nature. Yeah. All right. How did, I don't know where to start with him and Dunstan and Salisbury. Maybe we'll actually start, it just struck me as, as interesting that in 1964, Don Dunstan threatened to sue um, uh, uh, Stuart Coburn about an article that was essentially about Sapol. In 1978, uh, the other end of the relationship, Stuart Coburn thinks about um, uh, suing <laughs> Don Dunstan uh, over stuff that he'd said, and again, say polls in the middle of it. A <laughs> <say> police, but <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a good um, point. <laughs> yes, look, it had been said that he had a vendetta against Don Dunstan. Talk to me about that. Mm. Did he? Yes. Well, I yeah, yeah. I, I I don't I don't agree with that characterization. Um, I think that. Um, my father um, had a quite a good relationship with Dunson in the early days. Um, they would ride to the bus together sometimes, home from work, and they would chat. Um, I think my father didn't agree with all of Dunson's policies, and he was certainly a, a, a solid liberal voter at that point. Um, but I... Uh, the, 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 in fact, I think a number of people have written there was nothing contentious in their relationship. And then this article came out that my father wrote talking about um, uh, the views of some in the South Australian police force being um, uh, feeling that Dunstan um, didn't appreciate them and uh, the, the fact that they were trying to do their job conscientiously and so on. And Dad was reporting this, uh, and that was the basis for Dunstan to file a, a, a writ against the paper alleging that he'd been libeled. Uh, he withdrew that um, uh, within a um, fairly short space of time, and they moved on. But it certainly, you know, created a, a, a bit of sourness in the relationship at that point. Um, so then um, over the years, my, my father would write about Dunstan from time to time and write about the politics of, of uh, his, his government, what he was doing in South Australia. And there was a lot in support. Mm. There were negative things. He wrote a lot of profiles of appointees of Dunstan. He wrote about Roma Mitchell. Um, he wrote about... Um, uh, I'm trying to think, oh, environmental appointees with the new environmental department. 
he wrote a series of articles on the economy of, of South Australia and, and that, in fact, it was doing very well under Dunstan. Mm. Um, and when Dunstan turned 50, he wrote a profile of him mm. that was um, very balanced. And, in fact, Dunstan wrote him a letter. Wrote a lovely wrote, letter back to him. a letter. Wrote a lovely letter thanking him and, and yet for the profile. Round, <laughs> a, 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 in a round robin a year later, he was saying that he, he uh, to the family, that um, Dunstan was, uh, he no longer had any uh, confidence in Dunstan's integrity. It's not what, he's not a man of integrity anymore. Right. Uh, and yet when Dunstan retired, he also called him one of the, um, a remarkable Australian and a remarkable politician. Um, mm -hmm. So it yeah, was... So I think he had, he had um, mixed feelings about mm -hmm. Dunstan, which I think, we're not that unusual for. Right. But for look, that's like just that. the word, the use of the word vendetta, which was used by a, a Dunstan biographer. To me, that carries the back of my mind. I saw that word and I thought, mm, are they trying to say, imply something here about uh, Dunstan's sexuality and Stuart uh, being conservative? Uh, mm -hmm. and and being uncomfortable with homosexuality, to, to be blunt about it and so on. Yeah. So I guess I'm asking you, as you wrote this, did you get any sense that this was about personal things? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my father was um, conservative in, in, in social uh, matters. He was, again, as we said before, he was a man of his generation. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, he certainly didn't approve of um, some of the awful treatment of homosexuals back in those those years. Um, and so I I don't think uh, well, first I don't think there was a vendetta and I and I don't think that he that he held that against Dunstan in any specific way. I, I really think if if you look over the 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 sort of arc of my my father's public life, he was always concerned about good government and what made good government. You know, and he started out as a socialist and left wing mm -hmm. and he debated endlessly um, about politics and um, uh, how to make the world a better place. And that was his focus. And um, integrity in government was very important to him. And so I think that that when Dunstan started to show signs of perhaps, um, you know, being um, uh, arrogant and thinking that he knew all of the answers and, you know, quite frankly, being, uh, uh, you know, targeting journalists mm. who said things he didn't like. Mm. Um, there were a number of reasons, I think, for my father to decide you know, I think it's time for the Dunstan, you know, he's, he's had a good run, but he's showing signs of, of uh, being corrupted by power. All of which is well and good, but how does that lead to supporting a police commissioner who's keeping files on, on ordinary people? And some of them were just, there was one that I came across the other day. Now, it, it's an ASIO file, but it is, could well have come from special branch. And there were special branches in every state. Um, right. run by the police. And it's about Pam Cleland of the uh, of the Story Cleland family and Horace Salomon, who was a, a well-known restaurateur. And it's speaking about her, perhaps Pam Cleland, perhaps uh, uh, taking up with the Catholic Church, unlikely. Um, and, you know, Horst Salomon, who, uh, as I said, was a restaurateur, you know, New Australians, she associates with New Australians. She goes to New Australian restaurants. Yeah, he was interested in goulash, not gulags. <laughs> <laughs> but this was the type of, of childish tittle-tattle that was in the majority of these things. They, they were not, you know, your father wrote a piece saying, I'm starting to feel uncomfortable or defending our way of life. You know, that may be, as I said, well and good. But this, the bulk of this stuff was not about that. It was childish tittle-tattle. How did you feel about him supporting uh, Salisbury? Well, I, I didn't agree with, with the stance that he took uh, at the time, and, and we had discussions and arguments about it and, uh, and about, about the manuscript for the book he wrote, The Salisbury Affair. Uh, and, you know, I can't 
I can't fully explain uh, the position he took, except that he um, he had a strong sense of loyalty to people, and I think he he knew Salisbury, although he didn't know Salisbury that well before this happened. Um, he also, I think, was influenced by Sir Mark Oliphant, who came out mm. very soon after the sacking of Salisbury and praised Salisbury and was critical of Dunstan. Um, and again, my father had formed a, um, a, a not a close relationship at that point again, but he had had quite a bit of contact with Sir Mark Oliphant. He'd interviewed him. They'd corresponded. He admired Oliphant. Uh, and it he and this was at the point where he felt that um, Dunstan uh, was, um, you know, that the, the luster had gone uh, uh, from his him and his government. So I think that that strong sense of loyalty and of injustice. Hmm. Now I would say to him, well, but the injustice were these files that were being kept. What, on what about the powerless, who you as a journalist have exactly. always championed? Exactly, and in this case. For him, the injustice was this um, sacking of Salisbury without, you know, giving him any chance to defend himself and so on. And he saw it very much as a, you know, a political move. Um, and I think it was also just generally this feeling about society that it was, you know, getting away from him. It was so different from what he was used to. And um, I th I think that uh, this this was a this was another way in which he he was somewhat of a law and order person, uh, and he felt that there were standards to be maintained in the community and so on. Uh, and for those reasons, he came out on the side of Salisbury. You know, and I, you know, I can't defend it. Um, there are many people in the community in South Australia who mm. supported him. Many mm. people. Yes, indeed. The beginning of the uh, end of the yeah. in many ways, but yeah. So it wasn't. It what he wasn't uh, a total mm. outlier. Uh, but of course, they were primarily conservative elements of the community, and there were people in the community who did have more of a vendetta, and you know, at any. Price they would wanted to get rid of Dunstan and and pull him down. Again, I don't think that was my father's motivation, uh, but I I do find it hard to defend. To if I might sort of make a personal observation, this bit that you write of where um, this is was the end end of it, I think. And um, uh, Dunstan's gone on to talk with Kevin Crease and says, uh, you know, pretty strident things about uh, Stuart and another journalist. Stuart wants a writer of reply, gives as good as he uh, got. Uh, then the pair of them go on a split screen on the Mike Willisey program. I, I cannot, at this day and age, and maybe I'm more conservative than your dad, get a sense of why a journalist and why a premier would think that was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> what either of them, and I mean this, you know, seriously. I know we're laughing about it now, but really, you, you like, what were you, were you thinking? And there's a point where you just get, it's just you want to reach into the book and go, you shut up, and you shut up, and the, yeah. and you, you, you two, you with your thin skins, you're more yeah. alike than you would care to admit, <laughs> exactly. and you're both really exasperating. Yes, <laughs> I mean, no, I, I absolutely yeah. agree with that, and I. That recording is actually available at the South Australian Library, and I watched it. Um, <laughs> and I have to say, I was actually um, somewhat reassured. I thought my father was very um, self-contained. He was, he didn't, uh, he didn't lose his cool. He was very calm. And it was Dunstan that really was pretty awful mm. in that interview. Yeah. But I agree with you that it it. That was people would describe my father as somebody who wouldn't let go of something, and that was a prime example. Let's and sometimes talk. not letting go of something made him a very good journalist. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I, I want to talk finally um, in this part about why he picked something up. 
and, and that's the uh, case of Edward uh, Splat. Uh, give us a, a potted view of what that case was about, and then I'll tell you why I asked the question about why he picked it up. Mm -hmm. okay. So off you go. All right. So um, in the end of 1977, there was a rather ghastly murder of an elderly woman um, in her home, in her bed, uh, in um, the Adelaide suburbs. And uh, soon afterwards, Edward Splatt, who lived in the neighbourhood and worked at a factory across the road from this woman's house, was arrested. Uh, he was uh, eventually uh, tried, uh, found guilty, and he went to jail. Um, his lawyer, by the way, um, always was convinced that Splatt was innocent um, and that he had been uh, improperly convicted on the basis of uh, forensic evidence that was circumstantial evidence that really uh, was not credible. So, um, so fast forward, and in 1980, uh, my father was actually taking a leave of absence from the advertiser to write the biography of Sir Mark Oliphant. And he received a package uh, in the mail brown package with with hundreds of pages of handwritten um, uh, sort of exposition of what had happened at this trial. And it came from Edward Splatt. He was in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, and Splatt went into at length um, uh, why he thought that he'd been wrongly convicted. Um, he, he wrote a lot about the evidence in trial and so on. Uh, and my father's interest was 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 piqued and he he said look um i'd love to work on this but i'm 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 on a leave of absence absence i'm writing this biography i'll give you the names of some other journalists who could um look into this for you and splat wrote back and said no i want you to do it mm. um and so my father said well you're just going to have to wait because uh, i've got to finish this book so about a year later um, my father went back to work at the advertiser. He was still finishing up the publication of this book. And um, he started getting up at the crack of dawn every day and reading um, the trial transcripts and the appeal transcripts. And he interviewed people and he became convinced that at a minimum um, Splat had been wrongly convicted and that there was a very good chance that he was innocent. Uh, and the main thing that that struck him, and this was, you know, my father was totally uh, clueless when it came to science. <laughs> and he read all this, this testimony from experts about, oh, these, these particles of paint we found in the bed and metal and particles of this and that. And he said, I can't understand this evidence. Uh, how could the jury understand this and, and make a, a reasonable decision on the basis of it? And so he wrote a series of articles in 1981 um, and suggesting that the case should be looked at again. Uh, and um, eventually there were various inquiries and reports that were made that the Liberal government was very resistant to reopening the matter, but the um, Labour Party um, had uh, said that if they won the next election, they would um, look, you know, uh, set up an investigation. Eventually, there was a Royal Commission and um, it exonerated uh, Splat and he was released from prison. Now, that parcel, and this is why I asked why he took it up, that was all your father had to, to go on, this parcel of letters from uh, Edward Splat. I spoke the other day with Peter Norman, who was one of Splat's lawyers. And I said, why, why didn't Stuart take it up? And he said, good question, because those letters were unreadable. Now, we had the, <laughs> we had the scientific stuff and we knew uh, that, uh, you know, we were so convinced that this man had a good case. But all Stuart had was this stuff. I tried to read it, but I just couldn't. <laughs> uh, and so he said, good question. Why did he take it up? And I don't know if you can tell us that. Uh, if you could put the lawyer out of his misery, why did your father take it up when all he had was this, this cache of unreadable letters? <laughs> I don't know. 
know. I mean, I, I think um, I think it was partly that he he was able to put himself in the shoes of Splat, but also of the jury. Mm. And he was just very, very puzzled. Um, you know, how on earth could you have made a decision based on this evidence, which I find very hard to um, analyze and you know come to conclusions on. Did, did he consider um, that his greatest triumph? Was he that was he proudest of the Splat case? Yeah, he was. He was very proud of the Splat case. Um, yeah, for, you know, for just many, many reasons. I, I think that, you know, that this is to me, it's some, you know, it's sort of the pinnacle of journalism in the way, in a way that you, you take on somebody who's not an appealing individual. You know, he was Splat was a, um, uh, you know, a petty criminal. He was. Um, he wrote very, that too. <laughs> <laughs> he was um, not just not on a very appealing individual but um dad took on his case and he also took on the establishment he took on the liberal government um he took on judges and lawyers who didn't agree with him people he knew who knew well who were friends um and they were telling him he was um you know barking up the wrong tree this was ridiculous um, this uh, very conservative um, ex-judge Sir Roderick Chamberlain was telling Dad that he was undermining the rule of law for questioning the jury system, uh, and Dad was merely suggesting the 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 um, wisdom of certain suggested reforms that had actually been made by commission headed by Roma Mitchell to have specialist ju uh, juries when evidence is very complicated. So he was enduring all of that, and even people, his, some of his colleagues, didn't thought that he was, you know, crazy because it, you know he was on a mission. He was mm -hmm. a man with a mission. He was obsessed, uh, and um, you know, it 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 came out. It worked out, and he. So yes, he he felt uh, very proud of that, mm -hmm. um, and he did get a commendation. He had earlier won a, a Walkley Award for National Feature Writing mm -hmm. for a series he did in the early 70s about uh, uh, pyramid Pond selling. Yes. Pond, uh, but then he got Pond a commendation Pond. also for his work on the uh, Splat case. I think we've, well, maybe we've only scratched the surface, but I think we can see what we as a community got from him. I want to finish this for lots of reasons really struck me. Uh, it's in Washington. Uh, during the Kennedy years, my favourite. It's in 1962 in October in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And a nine-year-old girl walks home from school, an Australian girl walks home from school and announced, cheerfully, I think, that she timed the walk and that if a war started, she'd be able to be in home in time to die with her family. Now, that was you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you are a glass half full woman. <laughs> I guess yeah. what, what I, that made me think, you know, you, you've lived all your adult life in Washington. And, and what I wanted to ask you in finishing is, is what of Stuart's decisions or his choices or his character most made you who you are? Oh, gosh, that's a good <laughs> No one told you this was going to be easy. There was not a promise. No. No. <laughs> can, can, is there an answer to, to that? Because yeah, I think maybe so. Um, I think so. Um, oof. Well, I think, um, gosh, a lot of things. Uh, certainly his restlessness and the fact that um, I lived in several different cities growing up, went to a number of different schools, travelled internationally. Uh, and even though that was hard, because I was a fairly shy person, it wasn't easy for me to make friends. Um, but I think I, 
it certainly gave me um, an outlook on the world that I think would have been very different if we had just stayed in Adelaide all those years. Uh, and I think the proof is in the pudding that I, you know, I ended up moving to the United States and practicing international law and traveling around the world. Um, so I would say that that was a, a strong influence on me. Um, and I think his um, his sense his 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 sense of morality, his sense of right and wrong, that you know, the importance of integrity. Um, that made a real impact on me. You know, he wasn't a religious man, um, but he was, uh, I think he instilled on all of us that sense of, um, you know, being people of integrity, of doing, giving, giving back to the community, I think. Um, and I think I was very lucky from both of my parents that uh, I, gained the appreciation of music and nature and books that that was very much instilled in me so uh yeah I think he he made a very big impact you wrote a book about him and you still love him and you still love your <laughs> childhood uh, that's perhaps the best testament yeah um yeah. Jennifer Coburn uh, we could keep talking but we uh, we <laughs> shouldn't um, uh, because we need to leave something in the book for people to buy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you for being so generous with your time. Oh, well, thank you, Simon, for likewise being so generous. Very nice to talk with you. We had a couple of questions, and um, one of them was talking a little bit about the role of the journalist um, in contemporary society. You talked about your father's um, belief in, in facts and truth. How, how does that play in today's um, scenario with uh, online media, social media, constant information, misinformation? What's the role of the journalist and what um, can journalists, young journalists, learn from reading this book? Well, I'm sure Simon <laughs> also has, has a view on this, definitely. Um, You're not handballing the question to me. <laughs> you might need to answer. Well, I think that, uh, that it, journalism is as important as ever that the uh, the role of the media hasn't changed, um, and there is still uh, very much um, a role to play from uh, by established um, and responsible media. And the problem, of course, is that there are so many sources that. Uh, readers or viewers uh, don't can't necessarily judge the um, the worth of, um, and so that makes it much more confusing for the consumers of the information. Um, but um, I think that there are certainly internationally, certainly in uh, the United States and in Europe and so on. Uh, there are ways to find out uh, who can be trusted, uh, who is worth reading or viewing. Um, and one can get very good information and commentary uh, if, if one is in intelligent about it but it there's no doubt that it is very difficult and different from you know one of the big differences for instance in a place like the United States and I think it's the same in Australia it used to be that everyone watched the same news program everyone was getting the same information and that's the really big thing that's changed yeah and that, now, now we have to work for the truth 
Yes. Mm. I don't know if Simon has something to add. I'm sure mm -hmm. you could talk for hours on that. <laughs> Look, I, I, mean, <laughs> um, I, I think what Stuart's career showed was the importance of a, a good grounding in the basics. Um, and I think also that Stuart knew the difference and this is something that's been eroded by, by news organisations, so-called legacy organisations themselves, both uh, public uh, and private, well, private and public. So I would include the ABC on that as well. Stuart knew the difference between news and opinion and editorial mm -hmm. and features. And, you know, th there's another word for journalism, and that's reporting. And I think people think that's distinctly unglamorous these days. But sometimes, you know, there must still be a set of agreed facts out there that you just tell people about. You make up your own mind. There is a role for opinion. There is a role for editorial and there is a role uh, for just straight reportage. Um, and, and sometimes they can blend, but not all the time. And I think that that was one of the things that, you know, that Stuart knew well, and that I think we're in danger of forgetting these days, that, that there does, there is a distinction between opinion and news and editorial and features. Yeah, sure. And that it's pretty simple and straightforward, you know. You tell the story. What are the facts? Yeah. Um, another question was, this being such a personal project for you, Jennifer, what did you learn about yourself that may have surprised you? That I learned about myself? Yeah, that you may not have realised. <laughs> Oh, gosh, what have I learned about myself? Well, I learned that I could actually finish this. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, all, we all knew that. You're very capable. I, I had doubts, I can tell you. <laughs> oh, many doubts along the way. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I... Uh, what was your, for example, was your relationship with your father what, what you um, thought it was? Uh, yes, I, yes, I think so. Um, I, I think what I learned was certainly about him was the his intensity and his energy, and that I don't necessarily I don't share those qualities. Mm -hmm. I was much more like my mother, I think. Uh, but perhaps I did learn that I had, I had some uh, aspects of his personality too, uh, and that I I loved writing, which was something that perhaps I didn't appreciate until you know late in my career. That this was something I really enjoyed, and the sort of writing that he did. I was never a creative writer. I could never write a novel, but um, but the, the sort of expositional writing of explaining things and so on, uh, that was something I learned that I really enjoyed. Maybe, maybe you want to be a journalist too. <laughs> and Simon, just as, a, as an author, when, when you're writing about um, things, do you, do you surprise yourself in, in unveiling something that you didn't realise was going on? Well, I think that's, all, you know, the joy of, of doing it. Um, I'm looking forward to surprising myself like Jennifer did in finishing things. <laughs> um, <laughs> or being surprised that I can, you know. It, it's, um, there's a difference between sort of writing a long article and undertaking a book, and it's, it is a lot of work. Um, and I... And that was why I was so interested in asking Jennifer to begin with about, you know, just how she, that that process of sifting through things, you know, it, it's such a treasure trove, but it must have been so daunting. And, you know, you were saying that the articles, there must have been hundreds or thousands. Well, there'd be tens of thousands of them, I would expect. And then, you know, the, the other things that he wrote for radio, which, was, as I said, was quite ephemeral, um, you know, all of that would be gone. Um, yeah, and I think uh, actually that was something for my father that he was uh, whatever you your view of the book writing the Salisbury affair was a was a big hurdle for him when he realised oh my gosh I can write a book 
Mm. And I just love this. And he went on to write, you know, two major biographies after mm. that. And that came relatively late in life too, which gives me mm -hmm. sort of a great deal of hope as a, you know, an inveterate <laughs> procrastinator slash late bloomer. So that's a good thing. I mean, I think that, I mean, the thing that I really liked about reading uh, the book, aside from your writing, is just that there's nuance. Everything has nuance. I think there's this thought that, you know, somehow the advertiser was all establishment and everywhere, you know, there was this neat sort of play Fordian world and then along came Dunstan, the great disruptor. Now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, but there was also a lot of nuance uh, behind it as well. And, and, and people who were, you know, like your dad, distinctly uncomfortable with the sort of, you know, the, the unspoken accord that went on uh, in those years. Um, and his, his, the title of his book about Playford, um, which I must read, um, but it was a benevolent despot, a benevolent dictator, which didn't actually, didn't Robert Menzies come up with that? Because he reported Robert Menzies. So <laughs> yes, like that about. yes, Menzies actually came up with that phrase. Yes. Benevolent despot. Right. Did he mean it as a compliment? Um, <laughs> Backhand was the best. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't very happy that my father had quoted him in an article saying that. No. Well, you know, it means he was a spot on about Playford, but <laughs> that's, that's the thing that I, uh, I got from it all, that there is always nuance in, in things and that it is never neat and clear, and which is frustrating, but also, you know, quite sort of, quite wonderful. Yeah. Speaking of um, quoting your father, is there something that you wouldn't mind uh, dipping into and sharing some of your father's words with us? Well, I know that Simon would really like me to read <laughs> yep. uh, this piece of doggerel that my father wrote to my mother uh, when he was on tour with Sir Robert Menzies in 1953. Um, he had, they had traveled to uh, England for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. And then on the way back to Australia, they, had a, uh, they stopped in South Africa and uh, this was, I think, nearly two months that my father had been away. Uh, my mother was at home in Canberra. Uh, they, had, they lived in a house on Northbourne Avenue in Canberra. And um, my mother had two young children, my sister who was three and a half and I was about six months old and she was managing all of this on her own. And so my father who loved to write doggerel wrote uh, these lines. At Northbourne Avenue, 84, Beatrice wrestles with every chore. Dirty children, dirty grates, dirty washing, dirty plates. Rats and mice and slugs and snails, babies' nappies, babies' wails. But never mind, no more to roam. Papa's taken wing for home. To share the tantrums, share the toil, adhesive plaster and castor oil. The rain, the frost, the mud, the sleet, the dirty hands, the dirty feet, the dirty faces, the things undone. And really, you know, it sounds more fun to Atlas, press sec and luggage boy than even the Carlton Royal and Savoy. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, I love that. That's just beautiful. <laughs> uh, and um, we've got someone asking, Tell us about your next book. Uh, I am a one book person. Okay. So, <laughs> yes. All right. So what's the next biography you'd like to read? Whose biography would you like to read? Oh, gosh. Uh, there's, there are a lot. Um, I'd actually like to go back and read... Um, some of the work of Hazel Rowley, who was a, uh, I think, South Australia, she grew up in South Australia, uh, a brilliant um, biographer. And uh, there, there are several of hers that I have not read yet. Um, I might start with Christina Stead, the Australian novelist. Right. And um, the last question, I guess, for, for both of you, 
if someone was to write a biography of you, would you be happy for your children to do it? Um, I would. Well, I have a dog and a cat, so... Oh, know. well, I'll, I'll be reading that one for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I just... Jesus. I'm not sure what Connor the Irish Terrier would write. It might be sort of, you know... Uh, yes. Uh, Won't feed me, tells me to sit, you know. Won't yeah. walk when I want him to. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, we've got another one on the screen, if, you, if you're happy to stick around. And it's... Uh, Hello, Jennifer. What do you think is the most important thing that you've learned from your father? Yes, I just I just saw that now. Mm. I actually, in addition to what I, I said earlier um, about, um, you know, the importance of integrity and mm. doing something for the community, uh, I think the other thing actually relates to writing, and that is the importance of clear writing, clear communication. Um, that you that the purpose is to con is to help people understand whatever you're writing about, uh, and I really internalized that and and. Uh, took that very seriously throughout my life and my career. Uh, and, you know, lawyers often get um, uh, told that, that, you know, their writing is obscure and mm -hmm. difficult to understand. But my experience in, in my career was, was the opposite, that actually I, I learned from some wonderful mentors about the importance of writing clearly and concisely. Mm -hmm. And I often found that the lawyers were the ones who wrote better than the business people and others around them. Mm. And you realize that it's a skill that is um, is sorely wanting in society that uh, it's it's an important one. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, thanks. Thanks for your time. And it was it was great to hear this conversation. Great to have a bit of a chat afterwards. And just let me say on behalf of everyone how much we love reading great books. But we also love hearing authors talk about um, the whole magical process because most of us can't write a book or, we, or, 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 or we're um, feeling really um, like it's a huge hurdle and we love hearing about it. So thanks very much for your time. And for everyone out there, if you uh, want to revisit this one or any of our other lectures, if you hop onto our website, um, you can see about a dozen of our talks and this one will be up there in about uh, two weeks. All right. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you both. Thanks. Bye.